from CKCU 93.1 FM, this is Easier Said Than Done. Easier Said Than Done is a show made by two self-proclaimed creativity novices. We're your hosts, Natalie Hall and Emily Cowan, and we're on the pursuit to uncover the practices, skills, and joys of creativity in all its many forms, some of which we don't even know exist yet. This is episode 12. Hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. This is Easier Said Than Done's music producer, Graham Digby, and I'm taking the reins on hosting this week's show. So, this morning, I have an experience that's truly close to my heart that I want to share. Two weekends ago, on the 22nd to 24th, I traveled to Kingston for an unprecedented event, or unprecedented to me, at least. One of my favorite bands, Shushu, spelt X-I-U-X-I-U, from California, and now living in Berlin, Germany, traveled to Kingston to lead a lecture, workshop, and performance on experimental music at Queen's University. A bit about Shushu, they are an experimental band that started releasing music in 2002, relentlessly touring, collaborating, sharing stages with Sun Ra Orchestra, Ben Frost, Zola Jesus, Deerhoof, Prurient, Liars, Swans, Matmos, Faust, Grouper, Genesis P. Orridge, Angelo Badalamenti, and many more. They've released 16 full-length albums to date, and each one is a unique treasure trove and cannot be compared to the last. They wear their influences on their sleeves by covering an extensive list of songs, reinterpreting works of Nina Simone, the Magic Flute, and the music of Twin Peaks. But they have a very distinct style that's been described as self-flagellating, harsh, brutal, shocking, perverse, but also genius, brilliant, unique, imaginative, and luminous. So, Cuckoo Town is the name of the three-day event they put on at Queen's. And to start things off, I'm going to talk to co-organizer Andre Pora about the meaning and inspiration behind Cuckoo Town. But first, I'm going to play one of my favorite Shushu songs, Joey's Song. I 
Hi, Andre. I brought you on the show first to give a shout out and thank you for putting on such an amazing, wacky event. And shout out to Fan Wu as well. You guys are amazing. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming to the event. Thanks for doing this、uh, show. So, Cuckoo Town is the name of the three day event you co organized. Can you explain how you and Shushu came up with the name Cuckoo Town? Yeah. So, originally, like the, the working title of the event series was、uh, Shushu Visits Queens, riffing off their、uh, Twin Peaks cover album, Shushu Plays the Music of Twin Peaks. And then Fan and I prompted、uh, Angela and Jamie to come up with a name for the event series. And they came up with Cuckoo Town, which at first I was kind of like, what? This is kind of crazy. But then they had a really smart reason for it because, like, this all happening within this like, academic environment, like a very kind of dry, you know, the lecture, the workshop. The kind of expectations that come with academia, Cuckoo Town has this very, like, just goofy and silly kind of like irreverence that undercuts the potential dryness of it, which I thought was really fun. Right, right. In your opinion, what about Kingston is cuckoo? And has bringing Shushu to town maybe challenged some of the cuckoo ness? Oh, totally. I mean, Uh, I'm a complete outsider to Kingston.、Uh, I moved here two years ago for school.、Mm-hmm. Um, I'm from Mississauga. And like, when I came to Kingston, I kind of had like this huge culture shock because it really feels like it's stuck in this weird kind of like 19th century aura to it.、Mm-hmm. And、um, yeah, it's kind of within its own bubble, kind of like disconnected from the rest of Ontario in a weird way. And plus, Kingston kind of has like a long history of having like、uh, sanatoriums,、uh, mental asylums, prisons, the military base.、Uh, so you have these kind of very kind of like rigid institutions and histories that I think do cause a certain level of cuckooness. And、mm-hmm. um, the idea of the event was to kind of like, I don't know, highlight that, explore, make people aware of it, but also.、Um, In a weird way, kind of like create this feedback loop where it becomes so cuckoo that hopefully it breaks the cuckoo ness of it. Okay. So Shushu has a song called Clown Town. And I may be interpreting it totally wrong, but it makes me feel nostalgic for places I grew up and social dynamics I had to endure, even if those places or people are totally stuck in their ways or toxic. Um, and I, I know you didn't grow up in Kingston, but can you relate this feeling to feelings you might have about Kingston? And or did Shushu give you a new appreciation for Kingston?、Um, yeah, I mean, to answer the first part of the question, kind of like relating it to、uh, growing up,、um, I mean, not growing up in Kingston, but growing up in Mississauga, I grew up in a very like Industrial area right near the airport,、mm-hmm. um, kind of like on the periphery of the GTA. And、uh, yeah, like moving to King. And then, like, I mean, before that, when, when I went to school at York, that was like in North York, York University, which is also a very industrial, kind of like peripheral area. And then moving to Kingston, I was like, wait a second, I now again live in this industrial peripheral area.、Mm-hmm. So, like, it just really felt at home, but it also kind of like, Made me more aware of just how these environments and places affect people, or at least me,、uh, on like a subconscious level. I think with,、uh, with Angela and Jamie's visit, what made, made me more aware, changed my perspective of, of Kingston, is that there's these little pockets in Kingston which things can happen, but it's like you have to really kind of like. Do it yourself. It, it really is DIY or die. Because、um, I, I feel like in larger cities like Toronto or Montreal, like you have like a bigger kind of like network and energy and momentum of things happening that you can kind of slot yourself into. But in Kingston, it's like you have to do way more work on yourself to like, you know, motivate yourself and also get people to come out. I, I feel like Ottawa is kind of like that. 
for me at least as well um it's it's really fun honestly I, I love that aspect of it yeah uh thanks for sharing that um totally so I'm gonna play Clown Town by Shushu to nicely close up our conversation so thanks for being on the show <laughs> my pleasure That was Clown Town by Shushu, and I chose it because the name of the song is similar to the name of the three-day workshop lecture performance thingy the the band Shushu put on two weekends ago that I went to, Cuckoo Town. So, on day one, Shushu, a.k.a. Angela Sao and Jamie Stewart, put on a three-hour lecture at Queen's University. Yes, an academic lecture on the history of experimental music, or I guess more narrowly, a history of the experimental music that influenced the band. And this spanned from caveman times to present-day experimentalists. One of the oldest instruments Angela and Jamie said they're influenced by is the lithophone which looks like a xylophone that uses 
rocks instead of wooden bars. And instead of hitting it with mallets, you hit it with other smaller stones. Here is a clip of Jean-Louis Ringo playing the lithophone. So this 44,000 year old experimental instrument is still inspiring to new bands such as Shushu. It's pretty crazy. So I'm jumping way ahead but the band is really inspired by artists who started using pianos in unusual ways. Um, an obvious example would be John Cage's prepared piano where he put weird objects on the piano and messed with the mechanics so that it would sound different than a normal piano would sound. The clip I'm going to play is Henry Cowell's The Banshee where he plucks the strings on the piano instead of just playing the keys. This is a technique that Angela used in the improvised set the band played at the end of their visit to Kingston. Foreshadowing. If you listen to the end of the episode, I'm going to play a, a disappointingly short segment of this performance. So, moving on. A big theme in Shushu's music is exploring sexual identity and being totally transparent about topics that are often categorized as taboo or inappropriate. And in the history of popular music, there are a few people who paved the way for this kind of artistic expression. And they did it in awesome, sneaky, experimental ways. <laughs> That was a little snippet of the song Tutti Frutti by Little Richard. Now, how many people know this song? I'm talking to dead air, but I'm assuming a lot of you. But how many people know this song is about gay sex? Well, I didn't either until I watched Shushu's lecture. Probably because the lyrics they sung in live performances were different and more unfiltered than what they would play on the radio and record, and what is accessible to listeners now. Tutti Frutti is a bit ahead of my time, but uh, Little Richard and another musician, Escarita, were kind of the first rock stars to bring drag culture to the mainstream, challenge the gender binary, and pave the way for totally inappropriate bands such as Shushu. They dedicated a song on their last album, Ignore Grief, to these legends. This is Escarita Little Richard by Shushu.
Tuned to CKCU 93.1 FM in Ottawa. On to day two of Shushu's experimental music extravaganza at Queen's University. I have to keep this one brief for the sake of time, but day two was more of a participatory experience than just listening to the band lecture about a topic for hours on end. So, Shushu started the day by giving a little presentation on deep listening and then they prepped us by going for a walk outside where we had to be totally silent and observant of the environment around us and this kind of calmed everyone I think and then afterwards they explained the group improvised experiment that we are about to take part in so pretty much how it worked is Half the room brought out their phones and started recording using the Voice Memos app, while the other half of the room started playing little percussive instruments that the band provided. The people recording could record as long as they want, and then play back the recording on their devices as many times as they want. Everyone in the room walked around and mingled with each other, and after a while, the recordings got picked up by other recordings and no one was playing instruments at all and it was all just layers of recordings of recordings of recordings it's a bit hard to imagine but here's a little clip of what it sounded like Pretty cool to be interacting with people through this experimental improv bit and making music with Shushu. It was really enjoyable. And after the workshop was my interview with Jamie Stewart and I was shaking, but I desperately wanted to bring some of this connecting through improv and vulnerability and music to our interview. So what I decided to do was lead a sonic meditation. Now, I adapted this sonic meditation from one that my professor, Jesse Stewart, not to be confused with yours truly, taught me. And Jesse got it from the works of Pauline Oliveros, who Shushu were talking about in the lecture. And I thought there was a connection that had to be made. So for those of you who don't know what a sonic meditation is. I won't get into the details, but I'll explain the one I adapted to perform with Jamie Stewart. So the first step is we closed our eyes and observed the sounds around us. And once we got a pretty good grasp of the sounds in the room, we started humming along with them and tried to recreate them and amplify them. 
And once we had done our best to recreate the sounds of the sonic environment we were in, we responded to the sounds in any way we saw fit. This was the more interpretive part of the meditation. And then we were rudely cut off by a two-minute timer I set. So another reason I chose to lead this was to calm my nerves, since I was super anxious to interview someone I look up to so much. And it worked, kind of. I was still scared, but I wasn't so scared that I was unable to utter words. So here is the sonic meditation performed by Jamie and I. for me and interview. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. That's a first for me as well. All right. Um, so, hi, Jamie. Uh, welcome to Easier Said Than Done. Thanks. So our show is all about creativity and the creative process because me, Natalie, and Emily, the hosts of Easier Said Than Done, are looking for ways to be more creative in our own practices. So could you explain what creativity means to you and what are the moments in your life when you feel this spark of creativity? That's an interesting question for me. Um, I, I, without trying to sound too high-handed, I mean, it's, it's the sort of central focus of my life every day is to try to be creative in, in some way or another. And um, a lot of that has to do with my professional life, but on you know days when I'm uh, not involved in doing something professional, I still try to do a little bit of something that feels sort of central to my, to, to the purpose of my existence. But I think because it's something that is such an everyday part of my life, defining it might be really difficult for me to do. It's important to me not to be too analytical about the sources of creativity or the purposes of creativity or, uh, or the definitions or meanings of it. Only because for me, and I don't think this is a, in a general way, but just for me personally, I think that kind of gets in the way of actually doing it. So I think my definition of it would, just to sort of dodge the question, would be the basic definition, <laughs> which right. you can look up yourself. Um, and sorry, what was the second part of that question? Uh, what moments in your life do you feel the the spark of creativity? I, I think because I've... I've been doing it professionally for such a long time, I don't really rely on the spark anymore. I think if I had to rely on the spark, I really wouldn't get anything done. This is not the case for everybody, and it's, it's not entirely true for me either, but it does seem to be kind of a basic 
truism. I'm in my mid forties, and when you're younger, I think your brain just function in a, functions in a different way, and the spark flickers more often than when you're when you're older. I think just I think it's a, a physiological thing more than anything, or a, soci or a socialization. So I I don't I don't really think about the spark of the moment anymore. I think about just the the act of doing it. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in, in some ways, you know, in order to pay my bills, I have to, to do it. But also because I have to do it, I get a lot done. Um, or uh, the practice just becomes a basic, you know, like I, what I was saying before, just a basic part of existence. I mean, I, we have a studio where we live, you know, and I go there six or seven days a week. And for, for a long time, I, I, I kind of kept, you know, specific hours, you know, I would go in, you know, um, but I found that to be a little bit limiting or if I was... Um, but the the idea of going every day, whether or not I feel like it, uh, just it it leads to a, a particular momentum. So that the spark, even though it might not be incredibly bright, it's always burning a little bit because some amount of effort is always being put towards keeping it going. Um, that said, I think the times when we've done the things that people have responded to the most, it has come from a spark. It has you know it's come very easily. It was just right. mostly there. Not in every case, but I don't know, like if we had, I'm just, this is completely arbitrary, but there are 10 songs that we made and, and, and if they're, you know, that people seem to really, oh, you know, over many years still be attached to, probably seven of those were songs that were just from a spark that were there. Um, but I, I don't think that that spark would ever have arrived if, I, if we were just waiting for it. I think it came because over time we just kept throwing, you know, dried leaves at the bottom of it to keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, do you think this spark is something that can be fostered? Can you create it? Or... I think that's, what, that's just what, I'm, what I was saying. I mean, this is just for me personally. I, I don't get a lot out of taking long breaks. Like, if when I go... I go on vacation because sometimes it's like, well, I need to go on vacation and get the f*** out of Dodge or I'm going to lose my mind. But that doesn't have a whole lot to do with creativity. But I find that once I get back, it takes me a couple of days for the spark to be there. And for me, the spark comes from momentum, from constantly right. kind of keeping it going. Okay. Um, but, but there is, are certainly things that, um, that contribute to it, you know, like uh, reading or looking at art or watching movies or, you know, uh, participating uh, as a, as, you know, or passive participation in, uh, you know, the work that somebody else has done that, that is inspiring. You know, I probably get more musical inspiration from non-musical uh, aesthetics than I do from music. I think that's kind of a, an unfortunate part of working on music all the time is sometimes I feel like I got the f***ing idea, okay, <laughs> I just need some other kinds of input. Yeah. And it's, it's cool how circular it is because you'll put something out that someone else uses for their own creative process, so it's kind of... Oh yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a wonderful part of being involved in the um, art with a capital A world. Um, that's a nice way to think about it. That you know everybody else's output is hopefully contributing to other people's in a in a positive way mm -hmm. or a con or a productive way. Yeah. So I I can't imagine the amount of effort it must take to to give as much to the world as you do, whether it's releasing music. Um, your extensive amount of subscriber-only content and drunk commentaries and touring and workshops and stuff. A, a question my friend Annika has that I'm stealing actually is, <laughs> what cost does your creative output come with and what does Jamie's self-care entail? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, the cost is minimal. It's, I mean, it's, an, it's an extraordinary privilege to be able to do it. I mean, I mean, this is corny, but I mean, it's, it's such a central part of my life that I, uh, it, it's 99% benefit. I mean, outside of touring, and that's mostly the sort of the, the physical toil that it takes. And occasionally emotional. I mean, you know, if we play a bad show or there's an audience that is difficult to deal with, that can make me feel like a complete loser. Um, so that part of it can be, can be difficult, but you know, um, but the you know the the writing part of it uh, and the recording part of it that's 
entirely because I do everything I can to avoid reading any reviews whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's I mean that's all that's all benefit no cost at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean a, a lot of the subject matter that we deal with is emotionally very can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I mean, I'm just I'm going to use this word again. I mean, it's a privilege to be able to process it in a way that is productive rather than destructive. I, um, I, I think my, my, um, my sister has had a very, very difficult life and she has a very fulfilling career and it's exactly what she wants to do, but it's, it's, it's not something that allows her to process the difficulties that she's gone through and is going through in her life. And I know because of that, I mean, we've, you know, because we're related, we've gone through a lot of the same difficulties. Uh, I think I've come out the other end of it slightly less burdened because I've had you know the majority of my day deals with turning that you know that hurt into something else rather than just trying to ignore it which is what my sister has to do to get on with the rest of her day you know to be able to do what her pursuit in life is mm -hmm. but I guess as, as far as uh, self-care I like to watch movies, I like to go bird watching, I like going on little walks, I have a stuffed animal collection, um, my family Angel is my best friend, we hang out a whole lot, um, I like to do hippie drugs, that's a very positive part of my life, that's, fortunately I don't have a drug problem, I am kind of an alcoholic, so I try not to drink as much as I used to, so not drinking is part of self-care, but... Um, you know, looking at water is nice, looking at the sky is nice, you know, I have a big collection of art books, looking at those is nice. Um, pretty normal stuff. <laughs> so, so drunk commentaries are not self-care? No, no, <laughs> drunk commentaries are, they're funny to do, unless they're incredibly depressing. <laughs> um, I, I kind of wish that we had never started doing them only because I now feel obligated to do them with every record I have to get really really drunk to do it and so the next day I have a brutal hangover which I you know uh, an unfortunate time an unfortunate aspect of time passing is that my hangovers have gotten worse um, the bent the fun part of alcohol like I get less drunk so I have to drink more and then the hangovers are just infinitely worse um, so no, drunk comment. The bar drunk commentaries are a cost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those who might not know what drunk commentaries are, can you give a, a little explanation? Uh, there's this Pet Shop Boys record called Yes, and on the bonus edition of it, they did a commentary on the record. They just basically you listen to the record and they talked about it. And I'd never heard anything like this. This was maybe 2008 or nine when that record came out, um, or around maybe 2010. Um, and at that time we had a record out called Dear God I Hate Myself and I thought oh and I, at the time I was boozing a lot and I thought oh great I'll do a drunk commentary Hello you are listening to a track by track commentary of Dear God I Hate Myself this is Jamie Stewart and I did that drunk commentary and I listened to it the next day and I was like this is so f***ing stupid why did I do this um, and then about six Six years after that, I had found it and on some hard drive and listened to it. And, and after some time and some distance, it just seemed inane and sort of pleasantly stupid. Uh, so we put it out and it seemed like people dug it. So we figured, okay, well, we have a bunch of other records. We should start doing them. <laughs> um, I did, uh, and basically it's just being wasted and talking about listening to the record and talking about it top to bottom. I have found that um, the, we... We had a, a record called Oh No come out in 2021, and I did the drunk commentary for that one maybe a year afterwards, and it was way, way too soon to do it. I think, uh, you know, the, the, the drunk commentaries are the records that had come out, you know, like 10 years before or something like that. I think it had a lot more depth, there was a lot more time to process it, and the context is, the context of the songs um, became a lot more clear over time. And there were just a lot more associations and a chance to sort of process the events around those records a lot more. Um, yesterday, somebody, we had a record come out 
uh, last year, and somebody asked me if we were going to do a drunk commentary for it, and I think we probably want to wait about five years before <laughs> we do it. So right. I think at this Too point, soon. other than this last record, uh, I think we're, we've done all of them. We even did some EPs recently. Um, I just listened to the last four A one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're a band. They're super <laughs> indulgent. I mean, super <laughs> indulgent. I mean, really pretty lame. But it may be fine. Don't listen to Jamie's <laughs> commentaries. <laughs> so, yeah, on to the next question. I feel like you're a band that constantly breaks the fourth wall. Like, whenever my mind might travel into more imaginative realms when listening to Shoo Shoo, I always have the option to... I guess, listen to a drunk commentary and to get tethered back into like the mechanics of the music and f more focusing on you as a person. And I feel like your lecture did this for me as well. And I guess is the reason you do these kind of things to connect with your audiences on more of a personal level and less in an, like an imaginative realm. I'm not sure why we do them. I think we do them because it seemed like people like them. And I think, you know, I, we don't have a massive group of people who are interested in the band, but the people who are interested in it seem to be extraordinarily supportive uh, and incredibly generous with their, uh, with their time and uh, with their emotional openness vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the records and live shows. Uh, and I, you know, because of that, really, like the least that we can do is, if people are interested, and we're easy enough to avoid, is to be available if people want to talk or they want something that's slightly more broken down or slightly more intimate, like a you know drunk commentary or you know my email address is on our website and we we try to if somebody is saying something nice on whatever social media we you know try to say hello and thank you. Um, I mean, considering that, you know, the people interested in the band have made my life possible, uh, and if it is, you know, even in, in some tiny way, us saying hello uh, is, you know, is just is a, is a way to you know, just say thank you to them if, if that's something that they're interested in. I've been a pretty big fan of your music for a few, oh, few years thank now. You. Thank you. Um, and... I heard inklings of you leading some Zoom workshops a year and a half ago, and now you're here in Kingston, and it seems so random to me, <laughs> and, and so rare that such a well-known band like you would go out of their way to uh, lead a, a free educational workshop so far from home. Um, I was wondering when you first had the idea to lead these workshops and, and share your wisdom in a more academic way. Uh, uh... Fanru and Andre Poirier were grads who were PhD students here asked us if we would, if we would do it. And um, Angela and I are both deeply, deeply, deeply dedicated to music. But we don't think that all music is good. We think a lot of music is complete crap. Uh, so any opportunity to be involved in the propaganda of uh, what we think is <laughs> good music we want to participate in um, uh, and I mean, entirely because, uh, because it's, because music has been so important to us, uh, and, you know, we're, you know, have been pursuing it in a very focused way for the majority of our adult lives and any small thing that we could do to, to possibly, uh, shine a brighter light on what we what we think and what, you know we're being huge snobs but what we personally think is important or meaningful music um just in 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 the overall picture of the meaningfulness of music that's that's important to us we don't want things to be overlooked or overshadowed by what we think is crap so i mean if it's you know with 25 people we can you know play an alien radique piece if you know if you know, ten people have never heard it before. Maybe for those ten people, they get to be they get to be exposed to something that opens a lot of doors. You know, down a, a path that you know music becomes more meaningful to them, um, and uh, they 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 get to listen to something that uh, you know. In in it, Ellen Rudik changed our lives, and you know maybe by uh, 
uh, you know, playing playing her for other people, it will change their lives too. And then you know they can avoid mm -hmm. hearing some other garbage because you know, I mean, unless they listen to two things at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For my final question, um, what's next for Shushu, and which avenues are you hoping to take your creativity down in the future? <laughs> Uh, we have a new record coming out in September, um, and Angela's, uh, under her real name, Pyeong Hae Saw, is working on her third solo record. Um, we're starting to write some music for the record that's coming out after this next record. Um, we're doing a, a kind of a large-scale dance piece in, in Seattle that'll be out in 2025, so we're starting to write music for that. Um, Rehearsing a bunch for touring, just trying to get a jump on it. That's the main stuff. And then doing the subscription thing we do every month, but those, those right. are the, the main things we have coming. Um, as for what we're hoping to pursue, I don't, uh, I don't really like to talk about it, not because I want to be all secrety secrety about it, yeah. but I think it, then it becomes analytical and then it's, I, there's a, sometimes we have, I could say, okay, this next record is going to be this, 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 and this, um, but the, and which was the case with the one that we have coming out, it was pretty prescribed, or just what we wanted to pursue with, although it completely disintegrated and turned into something else, but for the, the one that we're just beginning to write, it's much more of a kind of an un unnameable feeling. I can physically feel what we're hoping it becomes, but I, it's dif difficult to describe. Like, we had a record in 2004. 14 called Angel Guts Red Classroom, and I could, like, we pointedly said, okay, analog drum machine, percussion, and analog synth, and vocals, that's all that that record is going to be, and it's going to be influenced by Suicide, Nico, uh, and Kraftwerk. But you know, for this, Current one we're just starting on it's um, it's much kind of gooier so I'm not I'm not sure I could explain it without ruining it for myself. Well, you you got me excited that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thanks Jamie for thanks, being Graham. on the show. These were good. These were cool questions. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for connecting with the the Ottawa community. Everyone is <laughs> in incredibly sweet. Thank you. Thanks for coming. All right. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> That was a cover of Screamin' Jay Hawkins' I Put a Spell on You by Shushu. 
And that song is the perfect opener for the final chapter of my trip to Kingston. On day three, March 24th, Shushu put a spell on me. So on Sunday evening, the 20, 30, I forget how many people attended, but everyone attending the Shushu event were instructed to take the ferry from downtown Kingston to Wolf Island. It was a cold but gorgeous ferry trip. And at the other end, we were met by a school bus and co-organizer Fan Wu holding a cute little shoo sign. If you go to Easier Said Than Done's Instagram, I posted a picture of this lovely moment. It was such a strange and funny experience being on a school bus full of shoo fans or a shul bus, as Angela said. Uh, someone made a joke that the bus was cursed and we were probably going to run into a ditch or something. The bus took us to a beautiful little inn that reminded me of something I might see in Newfoundland, like a beautiful, quirky, multicolored wooden inn. And we were ushered into the bar area where we all crowded around a piano and amps that were set up. And Angela and Jamie of Shushu came up, didn't say a word, and started improvising. Angela on piano, Jamie on guitar, with a bunch of effects pedals that they played around with. And they played for about an hour. And it was so intense and exhilarating. At one point, I was looking at Angela And in my mind, she turned into an evil sorcerer and was casting evil spells on me. I think the reason it affected me so personally is because what they were playing felt so present. It felt like a culmination of all the interactions the band had throughout their visit to Kingston. And they were bouncing off the energy of everyone in the room. I don't know if this was intentional, but at one point, someone's phone went off, and I swear Angela started mimicking the ringtone on the piano and interpreting it into the piece, which I thought was just, it just blew my mind. After the performance, I had an insane feeling of silence and bliss, like I had just squeezed out all my inner demons, and all I had to think about was taking the ferry back to Kingston with Shushu on a windless, starry night. All right, I'm running out of time on this episode, but I'll play as much of this improvised set as I can before the hour is up. So thanks for tuning in. It's an honor to have such dedicated listeners And thanks to the hosts, Natalie and Emily, for letting me be a total fanboy for Shushu for an hour. Bye-bye.
ました。